So I'm going to talk a bit about Cocos today. Uh, Cocos is a programming model we've been developing at Sandia for our own internal use and for external users. Uh, I'll talk at first a little bit about why you want to think of using something like that uh, before going into a tutorial section, which will be uh, covering the first like three or four percent of Cocos capabilities. But it will get you on GPUs and it will get, uh, and I will explain to you why data access patterns are really, really important. Uh, something which everybody who started using GPUs will probably know. So, I don't know if you ever heard this, uh, but there is an industry estimate which says that a typical code developer can roughly write 10 productive lines of code per hour, which means you get 20,000 lines of code from a full-time software engineer at you know, a company like Microsoft or Google out in a year. Now, if you need to rewrite your stuff for new programming models because your vendor of choice came along and said two years before the deployment of a platform, oh, we have a new programming model for you which you never ever used before, and now you need to rewrite all of your applications in this, then you, know, you need to touch a lot of lines of code. And the typical apps we run are somewhere between 300,000 and 600,000 lines of code. That's pretty universally true. I looked at you know, a number of them, there's you know, well-known ones like LAMPS or Quantum Express or the, and QMC Pack, et cetera. So that means a typical app port will take two to three man years just porting, right? This is not writing papers, this is not doing new capabilities. And at Sandia, we maintain a few dozens of those uh, applications. On top of that, we have large scientific libraries like E3SM is this, uh, this climate modeling uh, library set. Then Trillinos, you know, that's one of our big uh, math libraries. That's about four million lines of code. So that's roughly 20 man years uh, you need to set aside. Now, that's a big bit of a problem. And if we look at how we, what we expect future architectures to look like, it becomes a bit more of a problem. This is a vision of how we probably have, uh, you know, what our next generation systems look like, right? You're gonna have something in the middle which is like a CPU, you know, it has cores which are latency optimized. You're gonna have some kind of accelerator on top of it which has tons of tiny cores which are all throughput optimized. You have multiple different places where you can store me uh, memory or stuff, right? You have non-volatile memory which is like super large but super slow. You have DDR memory in there. You have high bandwidth memory on the accelerator. You might have high bandwidth memory on the CPU as well. Uh, you might have processing in memory, right? So this is kind of high bandwidth memory with some other elements in it. But on top of that, we also start to put in special function units, you know, like tensor cores, uh, sparse metric op accelerators, you know, general metrics or uh, multiply accelerators, et cetera, et cetera. This is essentially following something which in commodity hardware uh, has been happening for a while. If you look at your phones, right, your phones actually contain somewhere on the order of, uh, I don't know, a dozen or more different ships. Right, there's a special ship for the communication with the cell tower, there's a special ship for the graphics, there's a special ship for uh, you know, encoding and decoding, right? there's uh, encryption and decryption, right? there's special ships for your GPS thing in there, right? there's special ships for motion sensors, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason that you do that is because if you do specialized chips, you get higher energy efficiency if you, uh, compared to using just the same thing for everything. Now, the problem you have is you have all these applications and all these different architectures underneath. Every one of these might use a different programming model. And uh, you know, if you don't have something in the middle, then everybody writes to everything, right? So what Cocos does is it transforms this you know, many-to-many -many problem into a many-to-one, one-to-many problem. Everybody writes to Cocos, or you know, in principle, OpenMP or Raja or whatever, and then you write to the stuff, uh, and we then map to the stuff underneath. Okay, that's a bit of a motivation why we do this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Cocos ecosystem here, and afterwards uh, I'll gonna switch to the tutorial section and not go through the rest of this presentation. I basically, until yesterday, I hadn't decided what kind of talk I, uh, what kind of presentations I need to give here. So after talking to people yesterday at the evening session, I made a decision and to go more with the tutorial slide. So, what is Cocos? Cocos is this at first, a C++ programming model for performance portability. It's an, a library version, so you, we, we wrote a library, you compile it with whatever toolchain you use, you know, your preferred toolchain on every platform, 
And it's implemented on top of things like CUDA, OpenMP, uh, Rockham, you know, Circle in the future, etc. Uh, we aim to be descriptive, not prescriptive. So this is important. Uh, in our programming model, you more or less describe what you want to do, but you don't tell us how we do that. Okay? What that does is it gives us more freedom of mapping to the underlying architectures. Another important point is we are trying to align with the C++ standard. So about a quarter of our resources goes into work on the C++ standard. So we are proposing features which have been shown to be successful in our applications from Cocos into the C++ standard. And we also align our API with you know, developments in the C++ standard. On top of it, Cocos is also an expanding solution for you know, the common needs of your science and engineering applications. So it's not just the programming model, but we also have math libraries and tools and stuff like that. And all of this is open source. It's on the GitHub, uh, you know, in the Cocos organization. Um, and that's where we do all our development, all our you know, code development happens where you can track what's happening. This is the current state of the Cocos ecosystem. So we have Cocos Core, which is what I'm talking today about. That's the programming model, parallel execution, parallel data structures, etc. Then there's Cocos kernels. That's linear algebra stuff. So it's kind of, think of it like MKL or Kublas, Kuspars, and stuff like that, right? Um, whereas Cocos Support, which was a project funded by ECP, uh, which I'm partly billing for this here, which essentially is where for documentation, organizing training, training events, et cetera. So we've been typically giving like week-long boot camps. We've been giving tutorials all over the place. And then we have Cocos tools, which do like debugging and uh, profiling and tuning and stuff like that. The Cocos team now is a multi-institutional team. So it's spearheaded by Sandia. Uh, Sandia has essentially committed its uh, rather sizable application stock to being ported to Cocos. So we are porting our uh, mission critical codes uh, to this. The same is true for parts of Los Alamos and then we have developers at Argonne and Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory. And that's not the users, this is the people who work on the Cocos team, right? As who implement backends, who, uh, you know, who like debug code and so, you know, do bug fixes and stuff like that. We also have CSCS, which is the Swiss Supercomputing Center. Uh, we've been contributing an HPX backend uh, to Cocos for integration with HPX on their ap applications. Eh? Oh, wrong direction. Uh, some stats, we had like, you know, about 18 releases, only five since December 2017, so we only release like every four months at this point, mostly because, you know, most of the features are there and uh, the more users you have, you know, the more likely you want to really, really avoid breaking anything. Uh, we're about 50 contributors. We've been solving roughly an uh, issue per day over the last couple of years. Uh, and one important thing is if you want to use this, right, join the Cocos Team Slack channel. Uh, that's where we answer like short questions and stuff like that. So this thing is on my phone, you know, it pops up with push messages if somebody asks something. And so we typically answer things rather rapidly on that forum. And if, as you see, you know, we had 19,000 messages exchanged since 2017, mid 2017. So we are reasonably active on that thing. So coming to, the, to some of the meat of it, or at least of the you know, philosophy behind this, Cocos is based on six abstractions. And what we believe is, uh, from a computer science perspective, uh, these are the necessary but also sufficient abstractions or concepts you have to have in a performance portable programming model in order to write performance portable code. What are those? Well, basically two parts. There's a parallel execution and the data structure. The parallel execution stuff is things which a lot of programming models have. So this is, this is abstractions you actually will find inside of OpenMP, for example, uh, as well as in Raja and other things. What is that? In a heterogeneous world, you need to have execution spaces. You need to be able to control where do you want to execute something. Uh, you know, do you want to go to the CPU, to the GPU, some executor mechanism, some special function unit, whatever. You need to have execution patterns. That's what you use to express your algorithms. You have like a parallel for, parallel reduce, parallel scan, uh, that kind of thing, you know, building a task graph. And then you have execution policies which say, 
how you want to execute some of these things or how do you want to use these patterns. For example, do you want dynamic scheduling? Do you want to static scheduling? Do you want every work item being associated with a team of threads so that you can use nested parallelism? That kind of thing. What's a bit more unique to Cocos is data structures. Uh, one of the things we have is we have memory spaces and we have an abstract concept of memory spaces which is not just host device, right? We have, uh, in, in principle, this is both true for execution space and memory spaces, we have an N to M model, right? You can have an arbitrary number of execution spaces, an arbitrary number of memory spaces, and there's some relationship between them, you know, who can access whom, right? And who can be used from which side. Uh, that means memory spaces can also be used to express things like file systems. They can be used to express things like distributed memory systems, like in the PGAS model and stuff like that. Uh, memory layouts is for your data structure, how do you map your algorithmic indexing to an actual indexing in, in memory, right? That means if you have a memory layout abstraction, you can control uh, without changing your algorithm what your data access pattern is based on what architecture you're sitting on. And that's an important thing we're gonna come to in the tutorial section. And then memory traits is how you access memory. So for example, do you want streaming accesses? Do you want atomic accesses? You know, do you want non-caching uh, uh, yeah, non loads and stores and stuff like that? Um, yeah. But that's again a thing, a feature, these memory traits are a feature of your algorithm. How do you use the data in your algorithm? A uh, couple words to Cocos kernels. That's essentially our BLAST, sparse, and graph kernels on top of Cocos. Uh, the good thing is compared to the standard BLAST people are using, it's uh, scalar type agnostic, so we, you, can implement, you can use that with any type of scalar type. Uh, we use that for, uh, for, for example, for ensemble types, so we do you know, like BLAST operations like a matrix vector multiply with a type which has its scalar value, but also all its derivatives at the same time. Right, and stuff like that. Uh, it's layout and memory space aware, so you can give it you know, uh, data structures which live on the GPU or CPU and the library will figure out where to execute the math operation and stuff like that. Uh, it can call the vendor libraries underneath and because all of these views, you know, the data structures I'm gonna introduce later have all their sizes and stride information in, in it, you know, the stuff becomes way more simple, right? You don't have these weird Fortran calls where you have uh, a bazillion integers where you don't know which integer is actually what in your thing. You know, you just give it matrices and uh, that's it. Uh, another important thing is it has an interface to be called in nested regions and we'll actually we will come to that today. Cocos tools, that's a thing, you know, uh, which can interact with our stuff that knows about uh, Cocos. And that means instead of getting told that all of your time is spent in one header file because that's one, the one header file where it says openmp parallel 4 and everything else gets inlined there. Uh, it knows about you know, names for your kernels as you can call your parallel regions, right? And it will then interface with tools like VTune, you know, and we have our own tools, et cetera, and uh, that will give you much nicer introspection to that. What I want you to take away from that is, you know, all of these kind of helper things you probably need for a serious product are available. Good. Um, with that, one more little thing here. Uh, this is a subset of our users right now. So we have users all over the place, basically all the supercomputing centers use us, a lot of universities, you know, a lot of government agencies and stuff like that, but fine. Okay, I'm gonna come now to, okay. Um, we're later gonna do something on your, uh, on your platforms, we're gonna download, uh, as on Kool-Aid, we're, we're gonna git clone Cocos and Cocos tutorials into your thing and then do a couple of hands-on on the site. Uh, yeah, you just need to like git clone this stuff. Um, if you know how to do that, you can already start cloning that, uh, but we'll, I'll run you through that in, you know, in little steps later. So, um, I'm gonna teach you a bit about basic capabilities, mostly in this case. I don't go through the advanced capabilities. We'll, we can look at that a little bit, you know, uh, tonight, yeah? yeah so I'm, I'm mostly going through the basic things here, but uh, you know, you at your own leisure can go through the rest of the tutorial. All of this stuff is the slides in the Cocos tutorials on, uh, on GitHub. So, what do we want to take away from today? 
I want to take you away that, you know, with a single source performance portable code, uh, in particular, since I don't show you the complicated stuff, you will probably get away with a message, oh, simple things are really simple. Uh, and I want you to get away controlling data access patterns is really key for obtaining performance. So we'll talk a bit about that. Jump about that. Um, we are having a learning objective in this first little section of learning uh, terminology. So we are going to, I'm going to use uh, a couple of words uh, which have special meaning to us, and that's the pattern and the policy and the body. Uh, and I want you to learn what that means. I want you to recognize that, and I want you to also understand how this relates to like OpenMP, for example. And then we'll talk about the data layout problem. Okay. This is a typical thing you might want to write in code. You have a loop over elements, you have a loop over like quadrature points in the finite element code, and you know, it does stuff. Our terminology here is that, you know, at the course level, right, you have a pattern, you have a for loop. You say, I want to do something for a number of iterations. You have a policy which says, how do you want to go through these number of iterations, right? In this case, it says, I start at zero, I go to num elements, and I increment serially, right? That's, that's the policy for how to execute the pattern. And then you have the verb, what do you actually execute, the body? And that's essentially the, the code, which is the unit of work, right? And the pattern, together with the policy, drive that execution. They control, you know, how you execute each of these uh, units of work. Does that make sense? I generally gonna assume that silence means uh, that you totally agree with me and are, uh, uh, you know, totally in the loop. So, uh, what if we want to thread that loop? We could use OpenMP. What you do now is you essentially change the policy from serial to parallel. There's still the pattern there, the for thing, and you have to kind of repeat it in the pragma. Uh, but your policy is now split, right? On one hand, you have still this, I go from zero to num elements, but you changed something. You told that you can go parallel, and you don't have to execute these things in order anymore. You're allowed to assign chunks of this work to different threads. That's a policy change. So this is fairly trivial, you know, if you're on CPUs and if you don't have too complicated code. If you go to want to make this work with OpenMP4 on GPUs, you probably write something like this, uh, which is a bit nastier, OpenACC. OpenACC, you can actually write that a bit simpler because we have kind of uh, Compiler figured all out for me, uh, things as well. But basically, you have to control a lot of things, like you know, I want uh, num teams and num threads. You don't really know why I would you want these because you don't see the num teams and num threads in here. But believe me, you want them, uh, and so on. So the question is, can we do that a bit simpler, and can we do that in a way which looks a bit more C++ -y? And the answer is yes, because you can make everything look a bit more C++ -y. Okay. The point is that a standard thread parallel programming model may give you portable parallel execution uh, if it's supported on the target architecture and if you actually have a compiler which works. One of the nice things about the Clang OpenMP target stuff right now is that it uh, you know, solves the problem of your question whether you should include CMOF or MOF.h because you shouldn't include either because then it doesn't compile, uh, which might be good for some codes, but for most of our scientific codes, that's not a great answer. But you know, if you have that, then there's a question of performance. And one of the things I'm going to show you is that the previous examples don't control a crucial aspect of performance, and that's memory access patterns. And I'm going to show you that in a very simple example later why that is a problem. Uh, actually, I'm going to show that later as now. Uh, so if you have this kind of loop structure, right, uh, you typically access some arrays. And often, if you write C code, your access looks something like that. What is this array access, actually? Do you know what that little structure there means? 
hint what's the dimensionality of left in, and right in, uh, you know, in a math sense. Now, these two things are essentially, yeah, it, it's, it's practically a dot product, right? Um, but in principle, left and right are effectively three-dimensional you know, tensors, or they are three-dimensional arrays, right? This little indexing in there represents three-dimensional indexing, right? You have a, you have a thing which is uh, num elements times num QPs times vector size uh, array, right? But what you did is you hard-coded how your, you know, i comma j comma k, or in this case, element comma qp comma i maps into memory. And that is a problem, because while this is the correct pattern for CPUs, you know, in the, your innermost loop, you jump through the cache line, you know, one by one by one, right? You go from one element in the cache line to the next. This access pattern will make your GPU code 10 times slower. And we must be able to control that somehow. Okay. How do we generally do that before we go into the details? Uh, we do it through the C++ library because the answer to every problem in computer science is you write a C++ library. Uh, it's hopefully reasonably clear and concise and you know, we typically force you to go into thread scalable uh, you know, algorithms. You can write your algorithm once and then run it on all these uh, things. At the time when we wrote these slides, you know, it was multi-core CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and Xeon Phi. Nowadays, I would include ARM and, uh, you know, AMD GPUs and Intel GPUs and whatnot. Uh, that is if we get a working compiler. Uh, it hopefully minimizes the amount of architect-specific implementation details you must know, and we solve the data layout problem by introducing layouts. Okay, first thing, at the end of this, we're gonna do an exercise. Data parallel patterns. This is essentially how we write computational bodies, how we pass them to the Cocos runtime, and how work is mapped. And then we'll talk a bit about the difference between parallel for and parallel reduce. Uh, obviously, you should be completely familiar with that since you did that yesterday, I guess, in OpenMP, or, but I'll gonna repeat that anyway. Okay, this was your serial loop. You do four, you go from zero to number of atoms, do something, and then have some work body. Cocos does map work to cores. Generally, each iteration of your computational body is what we call a unit of work. We identify that unit of work with an iteration index, in this case, atom index. And the iteration range identifies the total amount of work. So far, so good. What you do is you give an iteration range plus a computational body to Cocos, and then Cocos figures out how to map this iteration range to the available hardware resources, right? It will sort this out, you know, send these units of work to different cores, and then give you the correct uh, indice. So how do you give computational bodies to Cocos? In principle, as functors or function objects. Who of you know what a C++ function object is? Okay, who of you doesn't know what a fun uh, C++ function object is? Okay. Oh, that's better than I thought. So a third knows, a third doesn't know, and the rest is in a Heisenberg state or so, in a Schrodinger state. Very good. Uh, so a functor is essentially a struct that has an operator in it, and uh, you know it's, it's something like ca called a callable, right? So effectively, you can uh, call a function object. It looks like when you call it or when you use the operator like a function, right? Because you say, you know my struct instance parent thesis and then it calls the operator. Uh, other than that, operators are more or less normal functions, right? You can almost do anything with it you can do with normal member functions. There are a couple very esoteric exceptions, but uh, I won't go into those. So how is work assigned to functor operators? You call something we call Cocos Perl 4. That should be very familiar to you. It's, you know, the same terminology as in OpenMP. You give it a number of iterations, and you give it a functor, and then Cocos launches stuff. To do that, the, the operator essentially must have a signature where it takes an index, because the operator needs to know which unit of work am I working on. But 
We don't guarantee you concurrency, nor do we guarantee you order of execution. Okay. This is, while it sounds like, yeah, who cares? Uh, this is actually really important because it indirectly means you are not allowed to write synchronization mechanisms. You can't write a spin loop in Cocos. Okay? And we don't allow you to do that because it's actually super, 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 super hard to do this in a portable way. In particular, if you go to architectures which are not x86, since they don't have funky memory models and funky forward progress guarantees, potentially, at which point uh, writing synchronization mechanisms becomes something you really don't want to do. So how do you pass data to things? You know, if you have an uh, functor, basically you make these guys uh, data members. You know, you access some data, so in order to do that, you'll make them data members. Great. Uh, how would you reproduce the serial execution from before the FET? You essentially create your atom force functor, you hopefully wrote a constructor, you call that thing, you know, you pass in the data, and then you call the functor. That literally is how the serial backend in Cocos would look like. Okay? So, this is the whole picture, right? You write this functor, you write a constructor, you put the operator, in the operator you have your previous loop body, and then you hand this thing off to Cocos. Obviously, this is super annoying, because if you do that for 10,000 loops, you know, you get annoyed. Uh, we get annoyed, and C++ people got annoyed, and so we invented the concept of C++ 11 lambdas. And what a lambda does is, it's an auto-generator for one of these functors. Basically, when you write a C++ 11 lambda, what it will do, it will create a functor underneath, and if you look at like type ID, dot name and stuff like that, it actually, the compiler chooses a name for it. The names will be something like, you know, if you create it in main, it will be something like main, you know, V, E, I, uh, one, blah, 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 something arbitrary. Uh, and that will actually be an object, right? What it then does is it figures out all the variables you reference or you access inside of your body of a lambda and makes a data member for that. It creates a constructor for the thing, and just before you use the thing, you know, it will construct the thing, right? Or at the place where you create the lambda, it will construct the thing. Does that make sense? It's not magic, it's just auto-generating that functor for you. But if you do that, and you want to use this lambda on a GPU later, you have to capture by value. That means you have to copy construct all the things in it, right? You can't just have a reference member in it, right? You can't just make a reference to the existing thing. Because if you do that, and you then try to use the lambda on a GPU, your GPU tries to access some stack variables on the stack of a, uh, of a calling thread, right, of a host thread, and it will awfully crash. And because it's a GPU, which is asynchronous, you will only learn of that crash later when you have a synchronizing operation, and you will think uh, that your crash happened somewhere else when it actually did. Okay, how does that now compare if we do lambdas? You know, in serial, you write a for loop, right? You have your loop body in OpenMP, you stick on top of that loop body with pragma OMP parallel four. In Cocos, you stick, you know, you place the four with a parallel four, you just give the number, and then use that little syntax to create a lambda. Okay? Now, before we come to our exercise, let's look at one more thing, uh, reductions. So, a Riemann sum style numerical integration, right, is a relatively straightforward thing. It's something a lot of people use, you know, as a initial example in like the basic scientific computing courses. And it looks something like that. You have a total integral, you loop over all the number of intervals, and then you get, you know, the value at the beginning of your interval and the end of the interval, and you just multiply it by like the, 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 the difference, right, in, in, in x position, and you sum it all up. That's awesome. So, how do we parallelize it, and how do we do it correctly? You could look at, you know, pattern and policy and body. Yeah, mm -hmm. Looks reasonably familiar, that sounds good. Yeah, then we'll just stick a parallel four in there and the number of intervals and do the body. Oh, I compile that and what happens? It says, I can't compile that. You're not allowed to modify total integral. 
The reason is that we treat all lambdas as const. But you, as a clever C++ compiler, know the answer to the problem when you can't increment this thing. You just get yourself a pointer, right? If a pointer is constant, then awesome, you know, now you can modify the value it points to. Great, I tricked Cocos. But unfortunately, you now get the wrong answer. And you get the wrong answer because you introduced the race condition. If you execute this with multiple threads, what happens is that thread zero loads the value of total integral, right? It starts to increment the variable in registers, and the other thread is loading at the same moment that total integral. The first thread comes back and writes its thing out, right, its updated value. The second thread increments its local value and then writes its updated value back, and you lost the update from the first thread. That is a typical race condition. So, what did you do wrong? The first thing you did wrong is you tried to be more clever than us and ignore our error messages. But basically, uh, the problem is you're using the wrong pattern. What you're doing here is you're using a for pattern instead of a reduction. The for pattern effectively requires you that every iteration is independent of every other iteration. The reduction pattern allows you to combine contributions from the different work items. And that's what you also do in OpenMP, right? Where you say pragma OMP for uh, reduction, right? And you tell it, you know, what is your reduction variable and what operation to use when you use it. How do we do this in Cocos? Basically, we also introduce this final reduced value and we give it as an additional argument to the parallel reduce pattern that's the place where you want to place the final result. Awesome. Uh, a little bit more to that. We also need to change the signature of our lambda. So our lambda now gets not just the index, but the second value. And that second value is the thread local version of my reduction variable. What you see here is that I replaced in the loop body the integration variable with the thread local variable. In OpenMP, the compiler does that for you. It's a neat little experiment. Try writing that little, exp that little code up there and print the address of total integral in the loop body. And that what you will find is that every thread has its own unique address for this variable because the compiler under the hoods replaced your total integral in the loop body with a thread local variable and combines them at the end in a reduction to stick it back into the original value. In C++, you know, technically you would consider this a shadowing and should issue a shadowing warning, but because it's OpenMP, it just tells it not to do that. Uh, we do that a bit more explicit because we don't write a compiler. Make sense? One last thing, launching parallel work is not non, has a non-negligible cost. That cost can be larger or smaller. The, the machines with the highest cost of launching parallel work, as far as I can know, as I do know, is uh, uh, other than FPGAs, where it's measured in potentially hours, uh, because it takes forever to finalize your uh, code. Uh, Summit and Sierra are probably the machines with the worst latency. On Summit and Sierra, it takes upwards of, somewhere depends on what you do, somewhere between eight and 30 microseconds to launch parallel work on the GPU. Um, basically, this is Amdahl's law. You should have heard that at some point. And this is kind of what this means. If you do the scalar integration, right, if you are below like 10,000 intervals or something like that, uh, you might as well just execute the scalar integration on a single core in serial in a for loop. Uh, if you go beyond that, you know, it's getting better. Uh, Cocos and OpenMP made slightly different choices in terms of where they optimize their reductions. So the OpenMP reductions are a bit faster on, at least in this compiler version, because this is all compiler version dependent, uh, a bit faster on the smaller side, while Cocos is a bit faster on the larger side. But in principle, you know, the point stands that you need to get to a reasonable amount of intervals before this becomes faster than serial. One last thing, I didn't do that yet, but, and some of the slides might not do that uh, because we forgot it, but 
Always name your kernels. You can give Cocos names, your kernels names, okay? You stick them in as a first argument and it could be anything which is convertible to a std string. And if you do that, then uh, our tools will give you useful information. If you don't do that, you're gonna get uh, type IDs. And type IDs might be more or less helpful. In most of our codes, the first 500 characters of our functor names are the same if you use the type ID because they are nested in some you know, template layers of libraries and so everything starts including with namespaces something like you know, uh, SDK colon colon standard mesh colon colon uh, you know, like uh, T Petra colon colon CRS metrics templated on double comma uh, layout comma execution space comma blah 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 et cetera et cetera and then somewhere back at the end you get the name of the actual function you launched. So name your kernels. Good. We come to our ex exercise. Uh, the recurring exercise I'm going to do through this morning is this kind of operation. So it's an inner product. We'll multiply a matrix with a right-hand side vector, multiply the, the, at the same time with a left-hand side vector, so you get a scalar value out. Okay? Pretty simple thing. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, I'll show you that in a second on, on actual console. Uh, Basically, generally we have, um, we have now these exercises. We are numbered zero, one through whatever eight. We are only gonna get to like three or four. Uh, what we have there inside of each of these subdirectories is a directory begin and solution. So there's versions you, know, you start with and there's the version you should get to. If you don't get to, you can cheat and look at it. Uh, in the begin versions, Every place where you need to modify code is marked with all caps exercise. Uh, I think this says this here, right? For all caps exercise. Uh, that's where you need to do something. Uh, sometimes we put helpful hints in there. In the first exercise, these helpful hints are kind of, um, uh, yeah, very helpful, I would say. Uh, what you need to do in the first exercise, do you need to include, initialize, and finalize Cocos library, and then you need to uh, parallelize some loops with parallel four or parallel deuce as appropriate. Please use lambdas instead of functors because otherwise you won't finish this exercise. And for now, for the first exercise, this will only run on uh, CPUs. Um, one thing to this initialize, finalize, uh, this is, think of it like MPI init and MPI finalize. It's something where we acquire our resources and stuff like that, and you do that right at the beginning. In fact, you do Cocos initialize right after initialize MPI. And you do Cocos finalize right before finalize MPI in a real application, okay? Um, good, so let me show you what you need to do. What we're gonna do is, um, I'd like you to do a, co a directory. Oh, wait, let me scroll this a bit up so that you can better see. Ah. Okay, very good. I'd like you to do make, make dear a directory cocos in your home directory, okay? Um, everybody knows how to use Cooley, right? I was told, everybody knows that perfectly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so I want you to make a directory cocos. Uh, I already have that directory and I don't want to overwrite it, so I name my directory Cocos free, okay? But that's just me. You just name it Cocos with a capital K at the beginning. Otherwise, you're gonna have to change like paths in the make files, which is a bit annoying. After you did that, you go into that directory and what you now do is you do a git clone https colon colon slash slash github.com slash Cocos slash Cocos. Okay? After that, you do the same thing with Cocos minus tutorials. Sounds good? Okay. When you go into the Cocos tutorials directory, you go into the intro full you go into exercises, 
And we'll start, so that's where you find all the exercises, okay? And we'll go into the zero one, begin. Okay? In this directory, there is two files. There's a make file and an exercise one begin. And you can just type uh, make. Maybe not. Ah, yeah, you can just type make. I'm actually unfortunately on a different system, so I need to compile this for a different architecture. Otherwise, I'm gonna crash. But basically, just type make. It will build the thing, and then you can run the exercise. Um, where is? You don't need to build Cocos individually, right? This is gonna be built as part of the, of the exercise. If you run your exercise with minus H, uh, you can find helpful messages <coughs> to what's happening. Let me scroll up again. And you want to modify exercise one begin.cpp. Okay, so if you do this exercise, um, and you run it with like, you know, minus S26 or something, and you change the number of rows, you get a performance profile which looks roughly like this. This is on a KNL, as a Knight's Landing, this is essentially Trinity, the, you know, I don't know, number four, whatever, five, six in the top 500. Um, KNL is on the, as a Knight's Landing side, the green line is the Haswell side, that's the CPU's dual socket. Uh, you basically get what you expect. You get like 120 gigabytes on the Haswells, you know, for most of the part. And if your number of rows goes too small, your performance drops because you don't have enough stuff to parallelize over, okay? Uh, this exercise, um, if you tell it S26 and you change the, num the number of rows, right, it essentially will increase the number of, uh, as of a, the number of columns so that the total elements in the matrix uh, stays the same, right? So the total work stays the same. On KNL, you can either run it in high bandwidth memory or in DDR memory, and you basically get the bandwidth you would expect on that. One of the things at the end here is on KNL, you have a drop in performance because the inner loops are now relatively short, and uh, so performance is starting to get uh, dominated by reductions on KNL. And unfortunately, uh, Knight's Landing isn't an awesome machine for communicating between the cores and synchronizing between cores, and so the performance drops reasonably rapidly, in particular in high bandwidth memory. Okay, we didn't talk about parallel reduce uh, with other data types and reduction operators. Be assured we have all the ones you might possibly need, min, max, max log, min log, min max log, and all the crazy ones. Uh, we even have all the binary and logical operators uh, Jeff Hammond from Intel said, uh, Cocos implements all the ones, even the ones nobody ever possibly could use. Um, fine. Parallel scan, that's the exclusive include with prefix scan, something we have, and then we have something called tag dispatch. Essentially, it allows you to write operators in your existing classes and have multiple operators in your existing classes and decide which one to use for which function. Uh, which is kind of cool, that's the way LAMPS is written. So, Hopefully this looks to you that at least, you know, the simple usage other than, you know, learning that you need to, you know, very mechanical write open braces equal, you know, blah. Uh, this looks reasonably simple as OpenMP does. Uh, there's three common data parallel patterns, uh, also parallel four and parallel reduce, that's the one we used, and parallel scan. And you characterize your computation by pattern policy and body. And you provide these computational bodies as functors or lambdas. Okay, we're gonna do, go to views. I'll probably go through some of these slides before we break for a break. Um, I want you to learn why we need views. I want you to learn some view concepts and template parameters and about the view lifecycle. So, this is a DEXB, a vector operation, a vector add. If you run that with lambda or with functor, right, that looks kind of like that. Now, the problem is, uh, if you do that, like in our exercise, you know, X and Y and stuff like that reside in CPU memory. You just allocated it with new, right? You got whatever the OS thought is great memory for you. While that works well, if you run on GPUs, uh, on CPUs, this may be a problem if you go to GPUs. So what we need is a way of storing data 
And in our case, we decided that the fundamental data type is multidimensional arrays, like in Fortran. Uh, and we need to be able to communicate these guys to accelerators, like GPUs. What is a view? It's a lightweight C++ class with a pointer to array data and a little metadata. It is templated on the data type and other stuff. And as a high level example, you write something like view double star, and I explain what the star means in a bit. You know, x, y, you construct them somehow, and then you use them. Awesome. Um, the important thing here is views are like pointers. More specifically, the default views, if you don't tell them otherwise, are like shared pointers, okay? They are reference counted. But that means you copy them, right? You don't pass around references to them. A little bit of overview. They are multidimensional arrays of zero or more dimensions. In fact, they are up to eight dimensional. Uh, we thought one better than Fortran 77 is good enough for us. Uh, number of dimensions as of a rank in the array rank sense, not in the matrix rank sense, is fixed at compile time. They are rectangular, not ragged. That means if you have, for example, a matrix, right, a two-dimensional Cocos uh, view, then every row has the same length. Okay? Uh, and the sizes of dimensions can be set at compile time or runtime, which is useful. A couple of examples. So this is all three-dimensional views. Uh, double star 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 means you have an array of doubles and you have three runtime dimensions. You construct them by giving them a name and providing the runtime dimensions. You can also make them have compile time dimensions. So the last one is all compile time dimensions. N0, N1, and N2 must be statically decidable variables, right? So you can use const expert functions potentially in there, but they must be evaluatable at compile time. Unfortunately, because double N1 star N2 or N3 is not a valid type in C++, your compile time dimensions must come last. Okay? That's an unfortunate effect, fact of life. Allocations and views only happen when explicitly specified through the constructor. There are no hidden allocations, so we don't do like temporary allocations for you, for example, uh, for copying them somewhere or whatever. Copy construction and assignment are shallow like pointers, so you pass these things by value, not by reference. And reference counting is on by default for automatic V allocation. So that's why we have these braces, because you create one of these views and it will just go away by the end of the scope of that variable and it will free all its memory underneath. They behave like shared pointer. So what does that mean? I create here two views, two one-dimensional views. I assign the second to the first, I copy construct another one, and when I assign one, two, and three to the first element, what gets printed? Okay, raise your hand for one, two, three, everybody else, <laughs> four, <laughs> uh, three gets printed. What happens here is at this place, A and B point to the same uh, allocation. They point to the allocation of B. A got deallocated again because its reference count went to zero. Now if you ask A for what its name is, it will answer B. Okay. When you copy construct C from B, so C will also answer on what is my name with B. And when you assign to the first element in the underlying storage one, when you overwrite it with two, and when you overwrite it with three. Okay? That's awesome. Um, <laughs> we have an exercise and about six minutes before break. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the exercise and then we'll uh, give a couple more minutes uh, later after the break for more exercise. And uh, you know, if you want a Bienchen, which is a German concept, 
Uh, actually, it's a German concept in prim uh, primary school, so maybe not fully, uh, fully appropriate. Uh, you can work a little bit in the break as well. <laughs> so what you need to do in this exercise, this is exercise two. It basically starts, as of this begin thing starts basically with a solution of exercise one. Uh, what you need to do is you need to change your data storage for the A and X and Y to being views of appropriate rank. Uh, and then you can compile and run it on the CPU. You also can compile it for the GPU if you turn UVM memory on and uh, you do that with these additional commands on the line, okay? And it will create two different executables, one for the host, one for, the, for CUDA. And um, yeah, then you can execute that on the GPU and you should get different performance on the GPU, hopefully. Make sense? And if you want, you can then uh, play a bit around in particular with the N repeat. That's an interesting thing where you will find some interesting stuff on particular on the GPU uh, and think about why you get that. Who all have run their stuff on GPUs and got about 153 um, gigabytes a second, I think, on Cooley? What? Awesome. What? 123 or something? 121. Okay, uh, run it with a larger N repeat. Uh, who of you ran it with N repeat 1 and got a bandwidth of about, I don't know, uh, 8 gigabytes a second? Or so. Nobody. Okay. Um, then I'm gonna demonstrate that to you, because you know I told other people that we shouldn't paralyze the initial loops for a teachable moment. So I need to show you the teachable moment. Um, and I'm gonna use a Kepler three seven card for your benefit, because that's what you had. Let's see where am I. Let me go to zero to solution, uh, module load CUDA, make minus J, Cocos devices, equal CUDA, Cocos arch, equal power, eight comma Kepler, three seven, and Cocos CUDA options equal force, UVM, Comma, enable lambda. Ta -ta. Done. Very good. So I'm running this guy. And let's see. Hundred nineteen, okay. That's weird. But fine. So what it did is it ran this little operation 100 times. That's this n repeat number here. And it got 120. Now, ah, right, I was running 26 and not 27. That's fine. Let me run with this n repeat 1. Am I so boring? Oh, that hurts. 7.7 .7 gigabytes a second. Now let's run with this with a thousand. Why? Why do I get 7.7? .7? Why is it so bad? Huh? Oh, here we get 156 I was talking about. No, it's not, the, I don't know, it depends on what you mean with initialization. Initialization is not timed. We start the timer before the parallel reduce and end it after the parallel reduce. Memory. 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 Exactly, it's moving the memory onto the GPU the first time around. What we did here in order to make this work on the GPU, we told it to use as its default memory space unified memory which is a memory space which can automatically migrate pages between host and GPU on demand. But what it will do is, in its first iteration, it will move all the stuff up because that's the first time when you touch the stuff or when you request the stuff on the GPU. 
After that, it's on there, and you get the full performance of the GPU. But this first move up to the GPU is slow. And that's what you get as an indirect timer here in your first kernel invocation. Okay? And that's why the performance is only uh, 8 gigabytes or so. In fact, this performance is slower, as far as I know, on Summit and Sierra, because our hardware got more clever. Uh, on, this, on this Kepler card, uh, the unified memory is a bit fake. It's done in software. And it turns out that the software solution, in this particular use case, is faster than the hardware solution. And uh, so on our top line machines, this is all even slower. Great. Any questions to that? You guys ran your first code on GPUs. Yay. Now we all know how to write perfectly performant, perfectly fast code on Summit and Sierra, and we are done, right? Uh, yeah, maybe not quite. <laughs> so, um, now I heard a couple questions of how does this thing actually know that the memory is now on the GPUs, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we, Cocos kind of did just something for you. So we're gonna talk a bit about memory spaces later. We didn't talk about it yet. We didn't talk about deep copy yet. We didn't talk about how data gets there. We didn't talk about layouts. We didn't talk about memory traits. And we didn't talk about subviews, uh, which is essentially a way of how you can get slices like a row out of a matrix and a, you know, whatever. Essentially, it's the Fortran way of, and the MATLAB way of getting stuff. So, what we just did is we had a code which never ever said in its code, you know, somewhere host or device or OpenMP or CUDA or whatever, and we'll just compiled it and it kind of worked on these different architectures. But sometimes you may want to do it a little bit more explicit, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about heterogeneous node and the space abstractions. We're going to talk about how you control where stuff runs. We're going to control, talk about how you control where the view data actually lives, how to avoid illegal memory accesses, and why we actually need Cocos Initialize and Finalize. And we're also going to talk about why the heck I snuck this Cocos Lambda into your code without telling you what it does. So, execution spaces. If you remember back, and every one of you remembers perfectly well back to that slide, right? We had six abstractions. One of these abstractions was execution spaces. The places where I can run stuff. An execution space in and of itself is usually a homogeneous set of execution resources. Think of it as a place and a mechanism to run code. On the typical system, you know, we currently have, you might have CPU cores where you can run code, and you have an accelerator which has a C of cores where you also can run code. Uh, but it's also the execution mechanism, so we have different execution spaces for cores, we, for CPU cores. For example, serial, then simple p threads, OpenMP, HPX. That's the ones we run in production right now. If you look at a code like that, right, where does stuff actually run? You know, where does this first stuff run and where does this loop body run? This first stuff, because it didn't sit inside any parallel construct, it runs in the process thread, whatever the calling thread is, right? It's just the thing, you know, in a normal code when you don't for some reason split your, uh, main into different threads and whatnot, right? So you didn't do anything fancy. It is your process thread, the main thread of your application. This parallel section runs something else, something, somewhere else. And if you don't specify where it runs, it runs in the default execution space of Cocos. Okay? So how do I now control where this thing is executed. One thing is you can change the default execution space at compilation time, and that's what we did. When we set Cocos devices equal OpenMP and nothing else, right, 
the default execution space became OpenMP. When I said Cocos devices equal CUDA, it became CUDA. If you say CUDA comma OpenMP, you have two execution spaces available, but the default one will be CUDA because we consider it the more specialized thing, right? And probably if you have GPUs, then by default you want to run on the GPUs at least at the end. So we make that the default. The other option is you can specify an execution space in the execution policy. Now you ask me, I didn't see an execution policy here, right? No, you didn't, but we introduced one for you uh, as a courtesy. Basically, execution policies was something, was one of these other concepts, abstraction layers I had said earlier, abstraction concepts, and it controls how you, you know, what kind of iteration pattern you essentially want to do, right? You have an, you have a, you have the execution pattern or the, uh, you know, the, the kind of algorithm you want to run and then you have the iteration space you want to run over. And the, the most commonly used one is what we call the range policy. And the range policy is templated optionally on an execution space. A range policy takes a begin and an end, so you can iterate from you know, something else when starting at zero. But if you give parallel four, or parallel reduce or parallel scan for that matter, just an integer that is equivalent to saying range policy without any additional arguments, so use the default execution space, starting at zero up to that number. Make sense? In order to use an execution space argument like CUDA up there, what do you have to make sure? A, Cocos must be compiled and your, uh, your application must be compiled with that execution space being enabled, right? If you say make Cocos devices equal OpenMP and you stick their range policy CUDA, the compiler will complain, I don't know what CUDA is, right? Execution spaces must be initialized and finalized. Before you can execute on the GPU here, you actually need to acquire one. You need to get the context for that thing, right? We need to start under the hoods, things like CUDA streams and stuff like that. Uh, that happens inside Cocos Initialize. On top of that, functions must be marked with a macro for non-CPU spaces. And the lambdas must be marked with a macro for non-CPU spaces. Effectively, what you need to do is you need to mark all the functions you possibly want to, to call inside of your parallel regions with Cocos inline functions and mark the lambdas with Cocos lambda. What is behind that? Behind that, if you just compile file for CPUs only, it's something like inline. If you compile for CUDA, it sticks stuff in there like inline underscore device underscore host. What does that mean? Effectively, um, in a lot of these models we use underneath, the compiler needs to know whether or not to compile a function for the GPU too. The GPU and the CPU have different instruction sets, right? They can't actually run the same binary code. So the compiler, in order to have a function available on both sides, needs to compile it for both sides. But the problem is that on the GPU, you're more restricted in what you are allowed to do. For example, you can't open a file, right? You can't call like stud.io kind of capabilities, right? Uh, you can't use std vector for that matter, right? A lot of the standard library kind of capabilities are not available on the GPU. So the compiler shouldn't try to just compile everything for both sides, right? Because then you're just gonna be kind of screwed over. It, they could do something where they say, oh, I'll just try to compile, and if it fails, you know, I don't compile it for that side. But how would you then know that you, you know, how would the compiler know that you failed, that it failed because you, it, you, it shouldn't have compiled this function versus it failed because you did something wrong, right? So that's why you need to mark up these functions. And that's what Cocos inline function and Cocos lambda do for you. Is that okay? Okay, let's talk about memory space as a motivating example. So what we did right now is we did this double star thing there, right, only. 
which is kind of cool. But where's the data stored right now? Is it in the GPU memory? Is it in the CPU memory? Is it in both? Who knows? Uh, I know. It's stored in memory spaces. So what are memory spaces? Memory spaces are basically places to put data, right? So we already have on our current machines, you know, like the high bandwidth memory on GPUs, we have a DDR memory, we have potentially non-volatile memory, like as a, you know, essentially these, these uh, little scratch disks and stuff like that. We have scratch memory on GPUs, like the shared memory. Um, and that's, you know, the places where you put things and that's what we call a memory space. Every view stores its data in a memory space set at compile time, okay? This is important. In contrast to raw pointers, we encode the information how this stuff was allocated in the type, right? If you allocated something into CUDA memory, right, you, know, you can figure that out at, on the type of a, of a view. We could have, we thought about it at the beginning, whether or not this should be just runtime information, right? We could have a query function on the view which says, where do you live? The reason that we ended up going with type information instead is that that allows you to, at compile time, uh, figure out where you want to execute stuff, right? Like if you have a function, like a blast function, you know, vector add, and you give it two views, right? That function can now defer just from the view types where it should execute, where it is allowed to execute. And all in all, you know, encoding this in type safe manner uh, seems to have been the right decisions. The memory space is an optional template argument on the view. You can stick it after your double star, star, star. This, the scalar type and the dimensionality of the scalar type, that stuff has to come first. There's a number of available memory spaces on the NVIDIA machines. You know, there's like host space and there's a CUDA space and a CUDA UVM space and a CUDA host pin space and uh, a CUDA scratch space and a uh, high bandwidth memory space. There's other externally available spaces like I.O. spaces and stuff like that. Uh, we'll come to that later. Each execution space has a default memory space though. And that's what we use if you actually stick something like the execution space argument instead of a memory space in the view. The reason that we allow that is if you compile a, a class or a function or whatever on, you know, where do I want to execute, then you can relatively simple figure out, you know, what should the type of views be, you know, I use in my algorithms. If no space argument is provided, as in exercise 02, the views data resides in the default memory space of the default execution space. Okay? And that is what we utilize to make this work on GPUs. We essentially, with this, uh, force UVM option, we changed the default memory space of the CUDA execution space from being a thing which is only accessible on the device to a thing which does automatic transfers, but if you are not careful, it costs you quite a bit of performance. Okay? Good. Let's talk about these spaces to make it a bit more clear. This is a depiction of what happens with a host space view. A view is two things. It's the actual view class object, which is a pointer, you know, and some metadata and stuff like that, and the allocation associated with it, right, which was allocated somewhere, which was allocated in the memory space. A CUDA space thing, if you create it, right, you create it in your master thread. At the time of creation, that metadata is still on the CPU, right, it's in the stack frame of your thread, but its pointer points to memory which resides in GPU memory, okay? So how does, you know, generally does it work, right? You declare some views, you allocate these guys, right? As a, if you call the constructor, uh, you instantiate a view of or lambda which capture these views. Then you launch the Perl something. What now happens during that launch is that we take that functor, which has now as a member 
you know, over lambda, which has as a member now the metadata of your view, right? The metadata of your view, the pointer and the dimensions and stuff like that is what gets captured. Uh, and that's what gets copied as part of a functor to the GPU, right? And our runtime does that for you. Then we run the kernel, and the copy of the functor on the device is then released. There is no deep copy of actual array data happening, right? The only thing we copy is the functor. So if you have a typical 1D view, that 1D view would be like uh, 24 bytes, because I think there's two pointers and the dimension in there. Uh, so if you capture that, plus maybe a length or whatever, you know, as a, then your functor has only a size of like, you know, 30-ish bytes. And that 30 bytes get, or 32 bytes gets copied to the GPU, right? The 100 megabyte or whatever your, fun your view is actually pointing to doesn't move upon this launch. Views are like pointers. So, now, there's still a bit of a problem, right? Say you have a single view, right? Like, you allocate it in CUDA space. Uh, or in this case, I told it to you know, <laughs> have a view in the default memory space of the CUDA execution space. So there's a difference between CUDA, which is an execution space, and CUDA space, which is the memory space. So all our memory spaces end with space, while our execution spaces don't. Um, we allocated that thing. We have metadata on the CPU and then device data, you know, the actual, the actual underlying uh, data on the device. Now, when we launch the Parallel 4, this metadata gets copied over as part of the functor, while the data itself doesn't move, right? And it still points to the same place. Uh, this is a bit of a silly example, but if you have a host and the device thing, right? At the beginning, metadata is both there. Then you copy it over, and both the metadata gets copied over, right? But the problem is now that when you actually try to dereference the thing, right? You can actually ask this guy, what is your length? Because the length was copied over. What you're not allowed to do is dereference the thing because in that point it tries to dereference a pointer which still points to host data. At which point the GPU says, I can't do that. I'm sec-folding for you here. So, now in a real code, typically what you're gonna do is you're gonna you know, maybe initialize data. Maybe you read it from a file. Maybe you have, you know, 100,000 lines of setup code, which takes, you know, 0.5% of your total runtime, and you don't really want to spend, you know, half of your time porting that setup code, so you run it on the CPU, right? You never stick parallel force in there. And then you want to use that array on the GPU. Now, if you allocated that in CUDA space, that's a problem in the setup phase, right? Because that will segfold on the host. Because now the host is trying to dereference uh, de a pointer which points to memory only accessible from the GPU. Yeah, if you allocate it with host space, the problem is on the other side, right? You deallocate on the GPU or dereference on the GPU. So what's the solution? There's a couple of ones. One is CUDA UVM space. I'll show an example of how this works. Another one is CUDA host pin space and mirroring. Uh, yeah. The CUDA UVM space is what we just used. We essentially made CUDA UVM space the default memory space of all the views where you don't say anything. And what CUDA UVM space does is, uh, depends actually a little bit on what hardware you're running on. On the Kepler cards, it actually potentially allocates, as it also depending a bit on the driver version and the uh, CUDA version, but think of it as it allocates arrays on both sides, right, on the CPU and on the GPU. Uh, and, and that happens underneath in the, in the CUDA runtime itself. And when you copy or when you start a functor which has a reference to UVM memory in it on the Kepler cards, it just copies all the data up, you know, from all the UVM spaces. It just makes sure that everything is updated on the, Z, on the, CPU, on the GPU side. When you access it again on the CPU, it will pull them back page by page. If you are on a Volta, as on a VLink based system, it doesn't allocate on both sides, it just allocates on one side and it moves pages one by one. But moving a page has a latency of a couple microseconds, 
That means if you do like something like a stream experiment, you know, on the, you run stream on the GPU, but all the data was originally on the CPU, or you do run stream over something which is more than, uh, you know, 16 gigabytes, as more than the memory in the GPU, then because of that two microseconds per four kilobytes or something like that, your effective bandwidth goes from uh, 780 gigabytes to four. even though the link itself is 90, right? So the performance portable way of doing this, as the one which gives you better performance in general, is what we call mirroring. A mirror is a view of equivalent arrays residing in possibly different memory spaces. Does that sentence make perfect sense? As I said, you know, I totally take silence as uh, agreement. <laughs> okay, so how does this work? You allocate a view, you know, you possibly typed that thing, and the view type itself has a type in it which tells you what is its host mirror type. And then you can allocate that, and you create that with a function called create mirror view, and you give it the original view, and then you get a new one. And what that does is you now have two views, one of them on the host, one of them on the device, uh, and you can call a function deep copy to copy between these two. So what's the typical pattern? First you create the view in some memory space, then you create a mirror of the view residing in the host memory space, or actually there's also ways to create any arbitrary other memory space. You typically would po populate the host view from a file, from setup, or whatever, and then you deep copy the host views arrays to the views array, right, the fed function. Um, this is like mem copy, right, as so you get the destination from a source. Yeah? So does it matter, like, in, instead of doing a view in the, some memory space and then have a host mirror, can you do sort of the opposite? Have a host view and then have a yeah, there are ways to do that as well. But, uh, but there's no like, performance difference or anything. Uh, no, the reason why you would do it the other way around is for data access pattern layouts and stuff like that, right? So there's other template parameters which are important and other runtime information which is potentially important. For example, how do you want to pad stuff? How do you want to align views and stuff like that, right? And uh, the reason that you don't just create a host view and a device view and then deep copy between these two is that stuff like alignment, layouts, etc., wouldn't match, okay? And so if you want performance on the device, you better create your original view on the device and then mirror into the other one, right, versus the other way around. Make sense? Okay, when you launch a kernel, processing the views array, doing something with it, and then if you need the data back, you copy it back. Yep? Uh, so the CUDA memory copy, is it synchronous by default or asynchronous? Deep copy with, with just the two view arguments is synchronous. If you give deep copy an execution space argument, it will be synchronous only to that execution space. So if you give deep copy the default host execution space parenthesis, you're gonna get a singleton of the host execution space, whatever the host execution space is, and that means the deep copy will be asynchronous to any already running kernel on the GPU. And it will automatically pin memory in the host space and do all that? It, uh, no, it will not. For, if for it to be pinned memory transfers, right, it needs to be, uh, you need to have allocated the host site in host pin, as in CUDA host pin memory. You can do that, yeah. That's one of the memory spaces. Yeah? I don't think I see where, like, how we know that the first view is something that is not on the host. Um, in this case, you don't see that, right? Because this is the generic example. But if you had written up there view double star comma CUDA space, then you would see that. This space is just a placeholder here, right? It's not actually a type. So this is definitely not a house, though. Like, and then you... Okay. No, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking about what happens if you're just on the host in a second, okay? 
if that's your question. This works generally. This works independently of whether or not this space is on the GPU or not. Yeah, that space would like specifically, is specifically something that's not the space that is just like the Now, if you would put there like, as a space itself is not a, this is just a placeholder in the slide. This is not an actual type. But if you were to put the host space, which is an actual type, then the first view is on the host. And what happens with the host mirror comes on the next slide in that case. Uh, what if the view is in host space too? That's the slide to answer your question. Uh, does it make a copy? You know, do you get another copy in your own thing? And the answer is no, you don't. Create mirror view, that's what this word view says, creates a mirror only if the original space is not accessible on the host itself. So the mirror space of a CUDA UVM space, for example, is CUDA UVM space, so it wouldn't actually make a copy because you can already access it. The mirror space of a CUDA host pin space is CUDA host pin space because it's already accessible on the host. The mirror space of CUDA space is the host space, just like normal DDR memory allocations, because it's not. If you always want to create the copy, no matter what happens, right, you can use create mirror instead of create mirror view. There might be algorithmic reasons to do that. Make sense? Does that answer your question? True. Yeah. Sufficiently? Awesome. Okay. We now do exercise three. Uh, in with this exercise will uh, make this example work on GPUs without using UVM memory by explicitly using you know, the host mirror concept and explicit deep copies to transfer the data instead of relying on the UVM space. Okay? Good. Oh, and try the number of repeats thing again. Can I interpret this noise as everybody made this successfully through the exercise? Ah, you go silent to show me that you agree with my statement. Very good. So what you have, should have seen is that if you go back to, um, to the uh, n repeat one, that now your performance is good the first time around. The reason is that you now have the deep copy explicitly happening outside of your timer. Right? And so everything is fine. So what did we learn? Data is stored in views that are pointers to multidimensional arrays residing in memory spaces. Views abstract away platform dependent allocations. In heterogeneous nodes, you have one or more memory spaces, and mirroring is good for uh, making that kind of work. Uh, heterogeneous nodes also have one or more execution spaces, and you can control where parallel code is run by setting a template parameter on an execution space uh, policy, or by compile time selection of the default execution space. Awesome. So, I announced early on that I'm going to teach you what it's all about memory access patterns, and that's what we are coming to now. You may also ask, why do I need memory access patterns? This just worked, right? Yeah, it worked because Cocos does something fun fancy with memory access patterns without telling you. Uh, so I want to teach you how the views layout parameter controls data layout, how memory access patterns result from Cocos mapping parallel work indices and the layout of a multidimensional array data, uh, why this matters, and we'll do a bit of a concrete example. Okay. So this was our example, right? We did the parallel reduce the parallel loop over this outer thing, right, over the number of rows, and then we had an inner loop over the, uh, the columns in each row. That's awesome. But how should A be laid out in memory? How should I store A in memory? 
Should I store this column major? Should I store this row major? What do you think? Ah, it depends on the architecture, exactly. The answer depends on the architecture. There's two options. Essentially, you know, for matrices, it's something we called, also there's, there's two common options, let's say it that way. Um, in 2D, you know, we call that column major or row major. In Cocos, we call that layout left and layout right. Uh, we call it layout left and layout right, you know, just as a generalization for higher dimension, right? Uh, and basically what that does is in layout left, let's see, what does my next slide say? Uh, does it say something? Basically in layout left, we have, uh, you know, the leftmost index is the stride one index and then we have increasing strides to the right. And in layout right, the rightmost index is the stride one index, you know, where elements are consecutive in, in uh, memory. We go to right. Ah, I see, I see faces which are like, what? <laughs> okay, column major, layout of a matrix, right? In column major layout of a matrix, you say, I store my columns consecutively in memory, right? I go in memory, first double, second double, third double, blah, 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 until I'm through and then I go back, right? In row major, I do the same. What happens in 3D? Right? In 3D, I could say, you know, oh, I go first this way, then that, then that, then that, and then I know go to the next plane, right? Or I could say, I go first through the planes, and then I come down this way, this way, this way, right? And so the left and right comes from, uh, if you think about your multidimensional indexing, right, you have indices, one, two, three, four, five, right? In column major, because the first index is your row index, right? It's, it's what we call layout left, because the leftmost index is the stride one, right? If you increase the left index by one, you go one element further in memory. Oh, so it's like when you're like accessing. When you access, access the data. Left and right yeah. Oh, okay. And the right one is the, the row major, right? Because if you increase the rightmost index by one, you know, you go to the next memory element. And then when you went through all of them and you increased then the other one by one, right, you increase by, yeah, okay? Good. It's good for you to know that because uh, C++ 23 might actually have layout left and layout right in it. Uh, so every view has a multidimensional array layout set at compile time. If you set the thing, it goes before the space. You don't have to set the space. The space is also optional, right? Every argument is optional. But if you have arguments, you know the relative order is fixed in Cocos views. The most common layouts are, as I said, layout left and layout right. But there are other ones, uh, for example, layout straight and a layout tiled and stuff like that, right? Which do more fancy things. You can write your own layouts if you're interested in and in theory, Cocos, as well as the C++ thing we proposed, MDSpan, uh, supports in particular also non-unique layouts. So you can have a layout which is, for example, a layout symmetric, where you say, you know, oh, i comma j actually references the same element as j comma i. That is legally supported in our abstraction. Obviously, you know, a simple loop over all the elements and scale them by two is a little bit dangerous if your layout is non-unique because you need to know, you know, which ones you're actually allowed to multiply instead of multiplying multiple guys multiple times. So, what we're gonna do is, we're first gonna do an exercise where we introduce the layout. Uh, in this case, the layout only matters really for A because, you know, that's two-dimensional, the other ones are one-dimensional. Layout left and layout right for one dimensional is in fact the same thing. So, you know, you don't really care. So we'll introduce uh, the layout for the views. Uh, and what you should do is you should experiment a little bit with um, the layout parameter. Ignore the execution space stuff, okay? We'll, we'll skip that for now because we run out of time. 
But I want you to experiment with a layout and with the different things, right? You compile for the CPU, test with layout left and layout right. You compile for the GPU, test with layout left and layout right. And you should try and figure out, you know, what's fast and what is slow and what layout you want for which, which architecture, okay? And after you did that, I explain you why you get the results what you get. Okay, so the answer to the problem of what you need to do is you get good performance as you, if you use layout left on the GPU and you get good performance if you use layout right on the CPU. And if you don't use it, you get bad performance. And depending on your architecture, uh, it's really bad. The worst one, surprisingly, is actually, uh, or maybe not surprisingly because it's always the worst one, is KNL. But you should have seen KNC. That was even worse. That was horrible. Oh, and that's very before that. That was atrocious. What? Uh, Knight's Ferry. But we never sold that. We had a cluster of 80 of these guys. They're like prototypes. What? They're like prototypes. Uh, this was essentially, you know, we had Larrabee, which was supposed to be the big, like, you know, we kill GP, uh, we compete with NVIDIA on GPUs. And then that Larrabee became then uh, Knight's Ferry. And uh, that was really awesome. Yeah, we were only place, uh, Sandia was the only place in the world which had a cluster of these guys. We actually wrote MPI for, Knights, for the Knights line, the first MPI, and gave that to Intel. What? You wrote, you wrote all the drivers in the implementation. Yeah, we actually wrote the low-level stuff, right? Uh, we modified the OS to actually make the OS work and stuff like that, right? Uh, that's the kind of stuff we do. So, if you had really much time, Maybe you wrote a script or whatever, and you actually ran all the different combinations, right? I think this is with S26 or 27 or something like that. You change the number of rows and you change the layouts, right? And you go to a couple of machines. When you will find something like this. On GPUs, you need layout left to get good performance. On the CPU architectures, you need layout right to get good performance, and if you choose the wrong one, you lose somewhere between, you know, four and 20x in performance. Uh, you also see, you know, at the beginning, the thing, you know, you don't have enough parallelism, that's fine. At the end on the KNL, you see the, oh, my reductions are slow, but other than that, that's fine. One interesting little, bump there is you see even a KNL a small cache bump at the back if you choose the wrong layout. So why is that happening? The basic question is here, what do your threads do and how do they you know, hang together in some sense? Call it thread independence. If you have this loop, right, the first question is, if I issue a read, right, when am I allowed to, and when am I allowed to, or how long do I have to wait before I can use that value? And on CPUs, all the threads are independent. So threads may execute at, you know, any rate. On GPUs, at least on the ones you used, uh, and everything before Volta, and everything on the other people's GPUs so far, uh, threads are synchronized in various groups in NVIDIA GPUs of 32. And so 32 reads must be done before any one of these 32 guys can start executing the next instruction. Okay? In particular, all threads in a group warp must finish their loads, right, before any of these threads in this group can go on. So the question now is, how many cache lines did you need to read in order to go on? On a CPU, if you have few independent cores with separate caches, right, what you want is you want these guys to read stuff, you know, you read stuff from a cache line, and then the next thing you do comes from the next cache, uh, from the next entry on the same cache line. That's what you really want, right? Because that means you don't even load a cache line for every read, right? Because you 
you load a cache line for the first read which hits the cache line, and then the next couple of guys hit the L1 cache and are good to go. On a GPU, because they are synchronized, what you want is that everybody hits the same cache line. Right? You all hit the same cache line, that means you need to for, you know, four or 32 or whatever, how many loads fit on the cache line, you need to load one cache line and then everybody can go on. Now you could argue, oh, why can't just every thread load its own cache line, right? And then sure, my first read is slow, but then everything is fast. And the answer to that is you don't have enough cache. You can't actually load cache lines, independent cache lines for every thread you have running on the GPU. We'll come to that in a, in a bit more detail, I think, at least. Yeah, uh, in a second. But basically, what this means is for performance, you want accesses in host space to be cached, while in CUDA space, or in generally in GPUs in the future, you want them to be coreless. What that means in caching is you read a thread T, yeah? currently accesses position i. Then you want its next access to be i plus one. So it hits the same cache line, the thing you already loaded into L1 cache. Coalescing is you want, if thread t reads position i, you want thread t plus one to read position i plus one, so that they both hit the same cache line because they are linked together. And this uncoalesced un access on CUDA space can greatly reduce performance. Let's look back at this array summation thing, right? We're just looping over a 1D array, right? Is this cached for OpenMP and coalesced for CUDA? It kind of depends. And basically it depends on how do you assign, how do you map iterations to GPUs or to, to the cores, right? What we do on on CPUs is we assign contiguous chunks of iterations to the same thread. So that they go from, you know, i, i plus one, i plus two, i plus three, and so on. On GPUs, we stride our threads in some manner. So, you know, you get the first thread zero gets zero, you know, thread one gets one, thread two gets two, and so on, and then the next one we get is, you know, n over p or something like that, and n over p plus one, et cetera. Why? Basically, that gives us the correct data access pattern, right? So generally what we do is, you know, as, a, as background information, but you, you know, there's a rule of thumb coming in a second. Uh, we assign contiguous chunks to CPUs and we can assign strided stuff to CUDA. The rule of thumb here is that by default, right, if you don't control somehow something else, if you parallelize over the first index in your arrays, everything is fine, okay? That is the rule of thumb. So basically what we do is performant memory access is achieved by Cocos mapping parallel work and it sees end multidimensional array layouts appropriately for the architecture. So what we did is when you compile for CPUs and you didn't specify the layout, right? We essentially, we want a layout, right? While for, uh, you know, which is good on host space because you're now getting cached, you know, the thread, because the thread in our example, right? It goes over the row. Right, it does internally the serial loop over the row. So you want the row to be contiguous in memory. So that was great. On the GPU, you want it the other way around. You want the columns to be contiguous because contiguous columns are assigned to the different threads. And that's what was the default behavior of what we did. 
So if you do this, right, and you don't specify the layout of A, when on OpenMP, we get layout right, on CUDA, we get layout left, and that means we get the correct cached behavior on CPUs and the coreless behavior on GPUs. Okay? And that's what you saw here. Right? We got coalescing, we got caching, we got uncoalesced access and un uncached accesses. So what we wanted to learn from this is that every view has a layout set at compile time through a template parameter. Layout right and layout left are the most common. Views in host space default to layout right and views in CUDA space default to layout left. And the same will then be true for, you know, the upcoming things for like the AMD execution spaces and the Intel GPU execution spaces and stuff like that. Uh, what I didn't really show you, you can write your own layouts, which means you can do all kinds of fancy things. Uh, for memory access patterns, you must result in cached accesses on CPUs and coalesced access on GPUs in order to get good performance. And we do map both parallel work indices and the multidimensional array layout in a way that that can be achieved. One of the things to note is there's nothing in OpenMP and OpenCL and CUDA and whatnot, you know, natively, which allows you to do that on your own, right? If you want to, uh, or which allows it to do that happen in the background, right? If you want to get the same good performance, you know, with a, say, say you wrote this code with OpenMP, right, and you just parallelized that outer loop, right? If you want to get this good performance, right, you need to write yourself a macro which changes your index calculation on your 1D array you used in OpenMP because OpenMP and C++ don't have multidimensional arrays, right? Which changed that indexing back and forth between CPU and GPU, right? And that's the capability you have in Cocos and we provide that in a robust way. Okay. If not, you need to do even something worse, right? The other alternative is you can actually change your loop structure, right? Instead of changing your data, you could change your loop structure all over the place. But that's obviously uh, an even worse choice to be made. Ah, by the way, who of you generally writes in C++? Okay, Fortran? C? Wow, oh, interesting. Python? Anything else? <laughs> Julia. Julia, okay. Yeah, I actually looked at Julia a bit, uh, found it kind of interesting, but um, I think the lack of classes means that, you know, implementing any large scale projects is a futile effort in the long run. Cool. So, um, that went surprisingly well. Good job, guys. <laughs> uh, let me decide, I think we'll skip the dual view one, uh, and we'll look at the, actually, okay, we'll, we'll look at that for a second. This is MD range policy. And then I'll introduce you a little bit to the, um, to the uh, hierarchical parallelism because it's a really cool concept we have. Uh, we won't do any of the exercises anymore, but uh, apparently we have, you know, all of you are super engaged and stuff and you love to spend your evenings after dinner uh, for a nice work day of, you know, 14 hours or so. Uh, so we'll do that and do exercises then, okay? So. Tightly nested loop, so a couple of you actually asked me already, can't I parallelize this initialization loop of the A matrix, right? Uh, can I do, can't do both loops, right? So for example, in OpenMP, you could do this with collapse. And the answer is yes, you can. And uh, what you do there is you change your policy. You change your policy from, uh, from a range policy to an MD range policy. So this was a motivating example, right? We have some kind of tightly nested loop and then we want to do something, you know, with these loop indices. Um, yeah. What we did is we parallelized just this outer loop, which is, you know, okay as far as it goes, but what we saw is 
what happens if you have few rows and you know, every one of these rows is really long? Your performance suffers, right? in particular on GPUs, where you need to expose a lot of parallelism. By the way, as a rule of thumb, how much parallelism you need to expose, right? For small work items, as if the, if the individual thread work is small, on a V100, the GPUs you use on Summit and, and Sierra, you need to expose somewhere on the order of 200,000 way parallelism in order to get anywhere. A lot of our algorithms saturate at around 1 million way parallelism for a single GPU. Okay? For heavy weight kernels where the individual work per, per item is large, you can get away with on the order of 50, 60,000. But below that, you will always, always, always lose tons of performance. Okay, so paralyzing just the outer loop is kind of bad, right? Because say n, i, n, j, and n, k are all 100. In total, you have a million, but you now only exposed 100, right? So what do we want to do? We use an MD, MD range policy. MD range policy, essentially what we're now saying is we have work items, but instead of just iterating over a one-dimensional space, we iterate over a three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space or six-dimensional space or two-dimensional space or whatever. Uh, the policy looks like that. You say MD range policy and then you need to specify the rank. With C++17, we can make that go away, uh, but currently we require C++11 only. Uh, you can compile with C17, but we don't use these features. And then as arguments to the policy, like in the normal range policy where we had a single integer as begin and a single integer as end, right? You give it here essentially uh, integer lists, you know, for the begin points and the end points. So this thing would iterate from 0, 0, 0 to n, i, n, j, n, k. But you could iterate from 1, 1, 1 or 1, 2, 3 to, uh, you know, n, i, minus 1, n, j, minus 1, n, k, minus 1 if you wanted to. What now happens with your lambda is instead of getting a single index, it just gets three indices. Right. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that because if you took, you know, uh, paid attention, you will ask, oh, aren't the access patterns important? Aren't the way I iterate over this important? And yes, the answer is obviously it's important. It's super important. So this thing has a couple of parameters. Basically, you can define how this thing iterates the same as with the layouts, uh, you know, over the space. And there's an outer and inner because uh, MD range policy by default tiles. And you can essentially specify how you loop inside the multidimensional tile and how you loop over tiles, right? As a how you go from one tile to another. Oh, I think there is columns missing here, probably because LaTeX decided that you don't need to display those. As a thing. Another thing here is, and that's just a side, there's other parameters you can stick generally in execution policies, not just MD range policy, but also the range policy. One of these things is as obviously you know, the execution spaces, but then there's an argument which is called schedule. So code goes colon, colon, schedule, and then in that thing it has another template parameter which tells it you know, whether you want static or dynamic scheduling. So if you want the equivalent to OMMP dynamic scheduling, even just for range policy, you can say you know, for 1D loop, you can say range policy, open the thing, you know, code goes schedule, co open thing, code goes dynamic. And that will then do dynamic scheduling. Uh, you can also specify explicitly what the index type internally should be. Uh, that's important sometimes for vectorization performance, etc. cetera. Uh, generally, as a rule of thumb, and I know the first examples violated that, uh, use signed integers. Signed integers are awesome. Unsigned integers are unawesome. Okay? Uh, the reason for that is that unsigned integers have a mandatory overflow check which means that vectorization and all kinds of other stuff is harder to do. And that means that loops with signed integers are generally faster than loops with unsigned integers. On top of it, you have to think about vectorization. If you have a 64-bit 
variables, you know, as your math like doubles, right, in the loop body. When it might make sense to also use 64-bit integers to, to, to do the indexing, you know, because that means the index vectorization compute vectorization and the math compute vectorization happens with the same vector length and the compiler doesn't need to figure out, you know, how to do one with like, you know, 16 byte while the other ones do 8 byte. All these things can go in there. In contrast to a view, the order of parameters is, uh, doesn't matter for, uh, for execution policies. Okay, the arguments are the initializer list. You know, for rank two, it's just two things. You can also use the Cocos array. I think you can also use the Stut array. Um, and there's an exercise. Good. Um, one other by, uh, example, before we come to a little bit of multi-dimensional uh, things. Subviews, taking slices of things. So subviews allow you to essentially get a slice of a, of a view, like a row of a matrix or, you know, uh, a plane out of a tensor or whatever, right? Uh, they point to the same data, so it's views, right? So they just reference the same data. Uh, they can be constructed on host or within the kernel, right? They don't allocate anything. It's kind of similar to, you know, MATLAB, Fortran, Python, etc. cetera. Uh, how does that work? So you allocate something, you know, if you wanted now this kind of thing where you want a two-dimensional view of that, you know, from that slice in the three-dimensional array, in Cocos, you would do that by giving one index and then Cocos all and Cocos all. Possible arguments are, you can put an index, which gives you just that one index. Every single index you give as an argument reduces the rank of a resulting view by one, right? So if you give me for a three-dimensional thing, you know, two indices and one range, the resulting thing is a one-dimensional thing. You can use a partial range with stood pair, Cocos pair, um, and you can use a full range with Cocos all, okay? Note that views do support degenerated ranges. So you can have ranges which are only one long or even only zero long. That's a valid thing to do in Cocos, okay? <laughs> one thing, you don't really know what the return type is because the layout might change. If you get from a layout left, right, as a form of column major thing, a row view, that view is now strided. That means we change the layout to layout stride of a resulting view. Make sense? Uh, another thing, constructing a view is roughly the equivalent of 20 to 40 operations, as like register, in register operations, right? So you shouldn't do that like, you know, say you have a thing, you know, where you have particles with X, Y, Z on it, you know, and you now get the subview of the three elements and then you do, you know, plus equal one on each of these guys, right? Now you just made your code much, much slower because, you know, it costs you much more to do the subview than it costs you to increment these things and do the 2D index calculation on the fly. So think about when to use them, right? Don't just use them like everywhere. There's also an exercise to that. We'll jump over the atomic stuff. Atomics are awesome. Uh, okay. And let me just go a little bit to hierarchical parallelism. Did, did we yesterday introduce teams in OpenMP? Was that mentioned? Not at all? Ugh. I thought teams was a really useful concept. Uh, it's an awesome concept. I think it's right now more useful than tasks. Uh, well, I think that uh, tasks, you know, long-term are useful. On the other hand, uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, the tasks in OpenMP, right, they don't work on GPUs, so they don't work on any of the platforms DOE is buying. Okay? Just as a thing to think. Teams works. Okay. Think about this thing here, right? We had this flat parallel kernel. We just parallelized the outer loop, right? Uh, so what happens if we don't have enough rows to saturate the GPU, right? There's a couple of solutions. You know, we could just flatten this whole thing out, right? And get loop over a product of them and do maybe atomics or something like that. That's bad. There's other bad things we can do. Uh, so, but if we 
think a little bit more about what happened there is, right, we did something for each row, you know, we did kind of like a parallel reduce on the inner thing, right? If you look at that, you could have thought in the beginning, oh, why don't I just parallelize the inner thing with a parallel reduce, right? That would have been a fine, you know, reasonable thing to do. But what this really is, is this is an example of hierarchical work. You loop over something, and then for every one of these things, you do something. That is hierarchical work, right? And algorithms that exhibit this kind of hierarchical structure, as well this hierarchical loop structure, can exploit hierarchical parallelism with thread teams. The important thing about thread teams is that threads are a collect or thread teams are a collection of threads which are guaranteed to be executing concurrently and thus can synchronize with each other. This doesn't mean you are allowed to write your own synchronization mechanism, but it does mean we give you synchronization mechanisms. There isn't a synchronization mechanism in the top level parallelism I showed you so far, right? There isn't a barrier you can call inside of your parallel four to make everything wait and synchronize, right? We don't give you that. But we give you a barrier to synchronize the threads which belong to the same team. So what's the high level strategy here? We do one parallel launch of n teams of some m threads. Each thread before, form, uh, yeah, just ignore that. And then the thread team does a reduction. There's more teachable moments in this, uh, but I just jump over them because we run out of time. So we'll just go to the right answer, not to the wrong answers and the teachable moments. So uh, the, the final kernel looks something like that, right? You start with Perl reduce because you still need to do the outer reduction, right? We tell it a team policy, and I'll show you in a second what this is. We tell it how many outer loop iterations we have, number n. We tell it how many threads we want assigned to each of these iterations. In this case, I said, oh, I have no clue how to decide that. Please, Cocos, you know, figure it out for me. So that's what this Cocos auto is. Then your lambda signature changes a bit. Instead of getting an index, you get a handle to the team, right? This is the, the resource handle which says, oh, which you can ask, you know, who is in this team, right? What can I do here? And so on. You get the index out from that team member. You ask it, what is my leak rank? That's what the you know, terminology in OpenMP is as well. And then you start a nested parallel reduce. In that nested parallel reduce, you use a different type of range policy, a team thread range. What that means is every team distribute that range over the threads associated with yourself. Right? Distribute that range over threads in this team. That's another parallel reduce. And then at the end, we contribute that thing back. We'll do it only with one thread for certain reasons. Uh, very good. So using teams is changing the execution policy. Flat parallelism used the range policy. Hierarchical parallelism uses the team policy. As I said, it's the number of teams and team size you give as arguments there. When using teams, functor operators receive this team member. And you can ask it, you know, which team am I on, which is the leak rank, and which thread am I within this team? You can also ask it for like leak size, team size, and stuff like that. But generally, right, you shouldn't, it's, it's, it's a bad practice to use the team rank directly to like index into your data structures or something like that, right? Because if you want to do that, you have to kind of associate you know, your, your, your team size with whatever your data structure size is. And you don't generally want to do that. Right? Generally, you should write your algorithms in a way that they are independent of the chosen team size. There are exemptions to that rule, but you know, that's the, that should always be the starting point. So, as I said, we shouldn't be hard coding this thing, right? But if we started now writing the outer loop and we gave it an operator, it gets a team member, right? This inner thing still looks like, oh, I want to do a reduction over m columns, right? And the main thing here is, that's, you know, if this were a parallel execution, right? If this wasn't already inside parallel execution, you would use a Cocos parallel reduce. And the answer is, yeah, this is parallel execution, 
So you do use parallel reduce. And this is called nested parallel patterns. The pattern is the same, parallel reduce. It has the exact same structure as the top level thing. The only thing is you, instead of using a range policy, you use a team thread range, a different type of range policy. The thing about that thing is uh, that you give the constructor of a team thread range this team member, right? Because it needs, you need to hand off that nested parallel reduce. Who are the threads I'm actually allowed to use now to execute that parallel reduce? Okay. Again here, the mapping of the work indices to threads is architecture dependent, so essentially the same rules apply as on, as on, uh, on the top level thing, right? The amount of work given to the team thread range need not to be at multiple of team size, so we handle remainders and stuff like that, right? I mean, the idea is to write algorithms which are independent of, you know, the architecture-specific architecture, architecture team sizes. <laughs> and then we handle the intra-team reduction, et cetera. Generally, you know, if you do this kind of structure, you can use parallel force and parallel reduces and stuff like that in any of these places, right? You can nest parallel force inside of parallel reduces, you can nest parallel reduces inside of parallel force and so on. You can have multiple of these nested parallel loops coming one after another, right? You can have a sequence of nested parallel force one after another. You can't nest a team thread range parallel four inside another team thread range parallel four. Um, Another thing is, here, you explicitly don't use the Cocos Lambda. For some reason, NVIDIA decided that nested lambdas shall not be marked with device or host or whatever. I have no clue whatsoever what drove them to that decision. Clang made it better. Clang actually does it correct, and you can still mark them. Uh, Clang does a lot of things better. Uh, but, you know, with NVCC, you're not allowed to do that, so you know, don't. The, the, the thinking behind that probably is that since you are already in a specific scope, the compiler knows what it has to generate this lambda for. Right. In practice, you know, you don't really decide what the team size is. We'll just figure something out. We'll take everything into account, right? So we'll actually check your functor for what is its register count, what is its shared memory requirements, and blah, 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 and sort out, you know, the best possible team size in a general sense. Um, and if you then do this exercise, you know, parallelize the inner loop, what happens is, you know, this was in exercise four, and this is in exercise five. What you see is we essentially drive the good performance down from, you know, we need like, 100,000 rows on the GPU to roughly 1,000 rows. Uh, who notices something else what happened? The layout. Look at the layout. Now the layout right is also the correct layout on the GPUs. And that is because you parallelized the inner loop. And the inner loop is now the threads which are close together, and the inner loop indexes into the rightmost index. So the rightmost index needs to be the stride one index. It means after using hierarchical parallelism, right, you're, you always want the innermost loop to do, be the stride one, both on CPUs and on GPUs. And that means you use the same layout on both sides. There's a third level of parallelism. You know, you can ex also expose like vector level parallelism, which is awesome. Um, but there's one thing, and I'll gonna, you know, I don't have time to really fully explain that anymore. A word of warning. Teams execute, or all their threads are executing all the time. This is like a parallel region. Like in OpenMP, when you start a Pragma OMP parallel, right? Uh, all the threads are active all the time. They are executing. If you have a statement there, which does in particular an atomic, like an atomic ad, right? You get that atomic ad for every single member of this team, even outside of nested loops, 
Okay? Even outside of nested loops, all these threads, and also potentially the vector lanes, because on GPUs the vector lanes map to kind of CUDA threads, are active. What the loops do is they take the range and just distribute the range to the threads. Right? So a thread enters the loop and it says, what is my ID? What is the total range? And which part of the loop should I execute? But we are executing all the whole time. The equivalent for those of you who are a bit more familiar with OpenMP for nested parallel force is, it's as if you started a pragma OMP parallel and then all your nested loops are pragma OMP4 novate. Make sense? The reason that we do that that way is, if you wanted something else, A, I need to write a compiler, but B, even if I were to write a compiler, I would need to dump all the state of my thread before I enter the nested loop into global memory when every thread needs to load that state back from global memory and then execute the nested loop pattern. And that costs you a lot. It's much better to have redundant execution. The only problem that means is that certain statements, in particular statements where you write into memory outside of these nested loops, need to protect it with a single statement, like an OpenMP. Okay. And you can ask me tonight again for, uh, to give that explanation again, if that wasn't 100% clear. Was that 100% clear? Oh, there was laughter, so probably that is not silence, so uh, no. <laughs> and from this side, this side was perfectly clear, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that was our short introduction into Cocos. Um, there's tons more of capabilities in there. The slide deck goes a little bit further. There's more other slides on the Cocos tutorial site. If you want to look at other codes, there's tons of codes online. You know, you can look at LAMPs, for example. You can look at uh, two million lines of Cocos-sized Trillinos if you are uh, really brave. Uh, you can look at Cocos kernels, which is the math library and has some clever things we do internally to implement sparse linear algebra, etc. But, you know, I hope you saw but you can write code, which is a single code, can be compiled for GPUs, CPUs, can run reasonably performant. That this all looks, you know, kind of, you know, sane C++-y, not completely insane C++-y. Uh, don't look at the internals of Cocos, that is insane C++-y. Um, and I hope you consider using this. Thank you.